You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Kara, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. So happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So you have such an impressive journey. You started off at Time Magazine, and then you worked in sales at CNN. You went on to be a VP at AOL, and you focused on e-commerce. Then you took some time to focus on your family, and you ended up launching Hint when you were pregnant with your fourth child. So you basically invented a new category within the beverage industry. You were the first, uh, you know, beverage to come out with no sweeteners and and uh, and you know you were the one who made water uh, more popular with uh, without having added sweetener. So that was a really big deal at the time. So Hint is now a household brand. You have a hundred and fifty million dollar company, over two hundred employees, distributed over uh, all fifty states. So that's amazing. Um, before we dive into the story of Hint and how that came about and your new book, Undaunted, I wanted to get an example of your confidence and your persistence. So um, this is something that I I saw, like, as I was reading your book, I realized you are successful because you are extremely persistent. You are, you have extreme persistence and that's what makes you you. So uh, let's talk about when you were a recent college graduate. You um, ended up getting 90 interviews all over the country, which is super <laughs> impressive in a time where the, it was a it was a bad job market. And, you know, the rest of your friends were getting unpaid internships and getting whatever they could. And, and here you are. You landed 90 interviews all over the country. So tell us about that moment in your life. I have lots of young listeners, probably recent graduates themselves looking for a job. How did you do that? What scrappy things did you do? And uh, tell us about how you landed your dream job at Fortune Magazine. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I didn't actually land my job at Fortune. I wanted to be at Fortune, but I ended up getting a job at Time, which actually mm-hmm. owned Fortune magazine. And um, and I figured that I would take the job at Time because it was in the building and eventually I would get to Fortune, which I never did. But uh, mm-hmm. But it ended up to actually work out. And it's something that that I talk about a lot that sometimes, you know, you like you have to accept that that your path and and where you ultimately land are kind of meant to be and oftentimes you don't necessarily know uh what Mm -hmm. that is um and why you're here but you have to take a deep breath and just you know keep moving forward and hopefully the dots will ultimately uh connect later but yeah so i i graduated um from school and my last semester of school i was going to arizona state university and my last semester in school um i was waitressing i had been waitressing um at this like 100 year old restaurant in um phoenix which was you know kind of an institution and it's like a you know they'd hate for me to say it but it's like a dumpy divey like great mexican <laughs> food place and um and uh, there was this guy that used to come in a lot and sometimes he'd be with friends other times he would um he would just be by himself and so one day i was waiting on him and i was like hey how's it going and and he said good and he was like so are you graduating and i was like oh yeah actually i'm graduating in a couple of months and he's like what are you going to do and i said um you know it's like the question of the hour right when you're like mm-hmm. graduating or you're just graduated i was like i don't know like you know i i said i'm i'm probably not going to be waitressing but you never know <laughs> like i was like whatever just being really authentic and honest about it and i and i just did what you know a decent, you know, communicator would do. I said, so what do you do? Like he had asked me what I did. And so I just said, so what do you do? And he said, oh, I do product placement. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And he said, I do product placement on movie sets for Anheuser-Busch. I was like, wait, I know what Anheuser-Busch is. So wait, you put beer on movie sets? And he said, yeah, we film lots of stuff in Scottsdale. And and so that's what my job is. And I was like, 
somewhat serious, but somewhat jokey. I was like, can you give me a job doing that? That'd be so fun. I'm a college student, right? That I'm like putting beer on sets. That'd be awesome. Right. And, uh, and so he said, if you're serious, I'll, uh, I'm happy to see if I can get you an interview. And I said, sure. And he said, but the interviews in Los Angeles and I lived in Phoenix and I said, I'll, I'll go to Los Angeles for sure um, to go and interview. And he said, OK, well, you know, give me your email and I'll try and set you up. So when he set me up, then I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to be going over there, maybe there's some other opportunities that I should look for. And so I said to him, I was like, listen, I, I'm interviewing at, you know, your firm and so appreciative. But in addition, do you know any other people that might need like entry level people? Because I'm going to LA anyway, and I might as well just try and mm -hmm. interview for a few days. And he was like, yeah, actually, I do know people. And, and that was sort of like the first point where I realized that if you actually ask people for help, and especially mm -hmm. people who are like already established and you've got kind of a competitive advantage, especially if you're young and you know, you're presentable, right? Like, and you're curious mm -hmm. and, and like, he was like, I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to reach out to them. And so he did. And there were a couple of other interviews. And then one of the people that he introduced me to said, um, you have to go to San Francisco to interview. And I was like, well, I'll go to San Francisco. Anyway, this continued on. <laughs> and it was like, you'll have to go to Chicago. You'll have to. And then finally, I just said, you know, there's like one place where I really want to work. And that's Fortune magazine. And so it was based out of New York. And so finally, I just said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure, I'm going to map this thing out. And I'm going to go to a travel agency. This is back before Expedia and Travelocity and all the rest of them. And so I went to a travel <laughs> agency and I said, I want to go from Phoenix to LA to San Francisco to Chicago, Boston and New York and over a 30 day period. Mm -hmm. And then I figured I'd just tell them I would be there in certain date in these cities in certain dates. And uh, the travel agent called me back and she said, it'll be like $472 for the airplane ticket. And I said, oh, I don't know if you heard me correctly. I, I uh, you know, wanted to go like it's single legs all the way around the country. And she said, no, that's mm -hmm. right. And so I took out my visa card and, you know, thankfully it wasn't maxed out. Mm -hmm. And I, and I gave it to her and I got the ticket because I kind of like was curious if there was like a mistake or something along the way. And I was, yeah. you know, like a little nervous about it, but so she gave it to me. And what I realized is like, I think I left, I, I think I took off to go to Los Angeles and I had probably half of the interviews um, already set up. But as I was like going on my way, I kept saying, I kept telling people my story. They're like, oh, you know, what, what do you, what else are you doing this afternoon? And I was really honest about it. I was like, I'd, you know, love to work for you. So don't take this the wrong way. But I said, I'm, I'm going and interviewing with a couple of other companies. And they're like, oh, like what kind of roles? And then, you know, and I would tell people, like, I just figured I had nothing to lose. So I would just share with people. And, um, and they said, that's really great. Like, are you interested in other things? And I said, yeah, I'm going to Chicago. I've never been there. I'm really excited, you know, to go there because I had never been there. And um, they and they were like, that's amazing that you just like went and found all these interviews. And what I figured out about like that journey, too, was like there were so many roles that I didn't even know existed beyond the the whole um, product placement. Like I didn't know what a consultant really was or, you know, nobody taught me that in school. And mm -hmm. these were roles that I didn't know anybody who was doing it. And so, you know, during those 30 days, I asked all my friends like, um, hey, do you think I can stay with your friend in Chicago or your parents? And I always had like a little bit of money to buy like a plant or a bottle of wine, like, so that I was like a gracious guest. Like I was always, mm -hmm. you know, really conscious about that. But otherwise, um, it was just 30 days of, it, I mean, it was amazing. And I learned a lot about myself and I came home and I was <laughs> just like, wow, I was so happy. Like I didn't know what I was going to learn out of it. Instead, I was like, it was, I, I feared it a little bit. I was a little nervous. I didn't get all 90 job mm -hmm. offers, but I had a lot of job offers. And, um, and I think it's, you know, I tell this story to a lot of, you know, college, uh, college campuses and also um, just kids that I know. I'm like, listen, you know, I, I paid for myself to, to actually go and, and show up there. And it, 
a hundred percent paid off. It was an investment in me, um, but it was also an investment in, you know, me trying to like learn about all these roles because I don't know about you, but like, you know, you read stuff, but you just don't really like, I don't know. It, it's, it's way different when, when somebody who's senior level, like calls his friend and says, Hey, do you need an administrative assistant? And they're like, Oh my God, I don't. But my friend down the hall keeps like looking for somebody. Mm -hmm. So yeah, connect me. And then all of a sudden they, you know, that, that you're not going in when they, have posted something and competing with all these people, you're coming in at a very different level. Yeah, totally. So, so tell us about, I, I really want my listeners to hear, you know, how gritty you were and the fact that, you know, you got a letter from an executive at fortune. Um, and it was basically some generic letter, like saying like, yeah, sure. If you're in New York, let me know when you're, when you're in town and stop by. And you actually stopped by you, you, you went into the office, you had no appointment, you walked up to the H HR department. So tell us that story and how you got your first job. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of my dream job because when I was in college, I mean, another th like little tidbit of advice that I give people is when I was at school, I, I was a communications journalism major and I loved to write. And uh, a few of my friends were in finance and I was, I was uh, you know, kind of thinking that some of their classes were pretty interesting, but I also felt that they were a little scary because I, what I realized is that I actually, um, didn't understand finance. Like they would talk to me about, you know, business plans and, um, you know, convertible debts and stuff like that. And I was like, what is that? And I was, and I was just really curious about it. And so one day, um, it just fit into my schedule that I could go take a finance class. And I'm like, Oh, this is really hard, like, and really interesting. And then, and then one of my professors said, you know, you should pick up Fortune magazine because it's, um, it will actually, if you just start reading it, you'll start to pick up on the stuff and they start to explain things in the context of an article. And so after a few issues, I, um, I was reading that and the Wall Street Journal. And, um, after a few issues, I was just like, this light bulb went off in my head around finance. And I was like, wow, I'm not scared anymore. And I, you know, don't know if I actually want to, you know, major in finance or my, but I decided to minor in finance because I was just so intrigued by, mm -hmm. you know, what I was learning. And, um, and so when I was, you know, sharing with a friend, I was kind of all over the map, like through this process of looking for a role, because I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I said, I really want to write. And I said, you know, my dream job is like, you know, working at Fortune magazine, because it's mm -hmm. just like, I think it'd be so great to work for this guy, Marshall Loeb. And then I just thought, like, what do I have to lose? Like, what the heck? I like the worst he could do. Like, I wonder what the process is. Like, I wonder what I'll hear back from him. And I, I just didn't take it that seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something it's sort of the like the core of my life. Like sometimes I reach out and any friend of mine who's known me, you know, for years will say like, you know, half the time, like in life, I'll just come up with these ideas and then I'll just throw them out there and I'm okay if they don't work. Like, I just want to know what happens. And if nothing else, it'll be like a funny dinner conversation. Like, well, I tried that, but, you know, it failed or, or that time it really worked. And in this case in particular, um, you know, Marshall, I thought, wrote me a letter back to say that if you're ever in New York. So while I was going on this journey, I thought, well, I should include New York. And I had a few other job interviews, um, but I just marched into the HR department and, um, and just said like, Hey, I've got this letter. And I didn't know that people didn't do that. Like I just figured you just go to the HR department and a lot of other um, interviews that I had been on, I showed that they said, just come to the HR department and we'll, you know, walk you to your interview. So, um, so I was trying to reach out ahead of time, but he wasn't writing me back. And so then I just showed up and I said, Hey, I'm here to see Marshall Loeb. Um, I have this letter from him and they, I mean, the, the poor receptionist, I can still see her face. Like she had no idea what to do with me because people just didn't do that. Right. And, um, and so, mm -hmm. and, and she called her manager and whatever, but it just so happened that there had been another conversation that went on, um, in the, it, you know, not to my knowledge, but, but 
basically this conversation was, let me just, um, or you've got to find me an executive assistant at time. And so I went and interviewed with this woman and it was in circulation. And I always tell people it was, um, you know, circulation is those horrible, like blow in insert cards that fall out of the magazines all the time. And that's all I knew about <laughs> it. Like I didn't really know anything else, but I knew it wasn't the mail room. It was like maybe one step above the mail room. And I thought, I don't know, it, it could be really f like fun to do it and eventually I'll get I'll show them what I can do in the writing side of things and get to fortune magazine which I never did um, get to fortune but it it's funny I actually just got a letter from Michael Loeb Marshall Loeb's um, son and he worked um, he actually founded entertainment weekly and which was also a time title and so I got to know him because he was very good friends with my boss and uh, mm. and anyway he wrote me a note saying I know how you wrote in the book um, and Fortune magazine had picked up an excerpt from the book a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, and he said, I know you wrote that my father, you weren't sure that my father actually wrote that note back to you, that it was like a, you know, a form letter. And he said, mm -hmm. my dad definitely wrote that note back to you. He said, and his father passed away a few years ago. And uh, he said he he absolutely wrote that note back to you. And he said, thank you so much for writing that because it just shows the kind Aww. of person he was. It was really, really sweet. Um, but anyway, um, the net of it is, is that, you know, when I went in there and I ultimately got the job, the thing that I also learned was, you know, it's not just about getting the job, but it's actually just doing a good job. And, you know, my, my boss, I mean, you read the book, you saw, you know, excerpts of this. I mean, my boss was going through a really challenging time that I didn't know that she was, her husband had just died and she mm. was in her early forties and, um, really tragically. And, you know, she was going through a really tough time. And so she generally was like living behind an office with the door shut. And I'm like 21 trying to figure out this whole thing. And, and basically I, I just was like, trying to look busy. And so I said to a bunch of other executives who would stop by just to see how she was doing. I'm like, hey, listen, I don't have that much going on right now. If I can be helpful in any way, let me know. And just because I really, that's just who I am as a person. And I've always mm -hmm. said to people like, you know, it wasn't that I wanted to gain any brownie points from it, but it ends up like being helpful is actually something that not everybody does right? Yeah. They're, they're more concerned and figuring out like, that's not my job. Like mm -hmm. I've got a job here, you know, I, uh, you know, and that's it. And so I was just, I was doing it just to stay busy. And, you know, I ended up meeting Michael Loeb and so many other people that were executives. And, uh, and actually the funniest story from, from my time, uh, magazine, um, episode was, was, uh, you know, making $23,000 a year in New York City, which is not a lot of money um, to be living in New York with. And, and so no. <laughs> every, right. And every week I'm, you know, try, I have enough for rent. I have enough to like go out one night. I'm really like trying to budget and do everything the right way. And, um, and so what I figured out was that in the like little kitchen, um, on our floor, there were always these sandwiches. And so I just, I was like, is anyone eating these sandwiches? And so I would pack up these sandwiches. They were from the executive lunches. And so after a while, like a couple of executives saw that I would take these sandwiches and they're like, what are you doing with the sandwiches? And I was like, I only make $23,000 a year. I've got to, I'm, I've got to eat. Like, I wasn't saying it for people to feel sorry for me, but I was just like, yeah, this is going to be Friday's dinner <laughs> and this is Saturday's lunch. And and I was like, and if you have any extras, my friend only makes $18,000 a year at, at an advertising firm and she likes turkey. And like, I was, I was like joking, but somewhat serious. And so I became this person who, you know, in the executives' minds, they would order extra food for me because they were like, Kara needs some food. Like, we have to make sure that she has the right sandwiches. Go before you order, make sure that there's chicken salad on the menu and croissants or, you know, or whatever. And what was so funny is there were a lot of people who were my age who they said, aren't you embarrassed to like actually say that you only make $23,000 a year? And I remember saying, do you like, do you think that they think we make more money? They like, 
everybody knows you're an entry level position. You're not making a lot of money. And <laughs> like, that's a competitive advantage to just be like, right? I mean, you've probably been there to be straightforward mm -hmm. with people. You don't like, oh, I'm not yeah. making millions, right? When you're young, people want to be helpful, right? And what was so funny years yeah. later, and this is like 25 years later, I get this phone call from Amazon and um, the buyer at Amazon is like, you don't remember me, but I worked at Time Magazine on the other side of um, the building from you. But I remember you used to come by and get the sandwiches for like the extra sandwiches. And I said, oh my God, I'm, I'm so embarrassed that you like remember this. And he said, no, you were so funny. He was like, we were all like laughing because every publisher from all the different publications were like, you know, she's so like honest about it. Like, and I remember when I was 21 and I didn't want to like, I hardly had money to eat. And Kara was just like, you know, you know, yeah, be so great if you guys ordered me extra stuff. If you have a cookie now and then, like, just order that too. And so anyway, it was just so funny. And ultimately, he was like, somebody told me that you had started this company, Hint. And I was like, get out of here. Like, she's now you know, she was an executive at AOL and then she decided to start Hint. And he's like, that is so funny because I totally remember you. So you, so something as simple as that, again, I didn't intend on like having him remember me or certainly didn't know that he was going to be at Amazon. But it's like, how do you ultimately stand out in some way? Yeah. Again, with kindness and be helpful. And he was like, I just remember you were so hardworking. And so this is, that's a story that I even share internally to my team that it's like, you know, it's not just about making your boss happy and about doing a great job in your own, but your colleagues are ultimately going to be the ones that are going to, you know, help you later on. Yeah. Like maybe they know about a job at a company. And, and so if you're like a person that's like complaining or, you know, so concerned about putting rails on kind of what your job is. I mean, you've, I'm sure yeah. you've been there and watched this. Mm -hmm. It's like really short sighted because you don't know who's watching. Instead, if you, you know, don't like your situation, then, you know, figure out how to change that situation, but also figure out around you, like, you know, how do you get noticed in a way where you can sort of, you know, don't, don't not do your job. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, you know, be helpful to people. Like if they're, mm -hmm. if they're buried, right. Say like, listen, can I, can I stay extra and we can order pizza and let me help you like catch up on stuff. I don't mind doing that because you never know how that's yeah. going to pay off in the long term. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much for going into so much detail with that story i think you uncovered so many like good pieces of advice and i totally agree that like having the best intentions just working really hard being nice to everyone being open authentic all that stuff is so important especially when you're like just starting out and getting your foot in the door um so it, it and it's amazing how full circle your life has went so you didn't get that you know reporter job at fortune but in 2011 you were named like top 10 female entrepreneur by Fortune fortune magazine so um that's amazing congratulations um thank you cool well let's jump into your journey with founding hints uh since you gave us so much great information about your your career journey so you were um having some personal health struggles from what i recall you were you know after your third pregnancy you had uh, gained weight you were like 50 pounds overweight you were addicted to diet soda um, you felt really tired. So tell us about that time in your life. Like, like, how did you realize something was wrong? How did you uncover that diet soda might have been the root of all of these problems that you were having? And how did that lead you to thinking about starting Hint? Yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting thing when I wouldn't say that I was like, totally aware that I had specific health issues, but I found, and I've talked to people about this since then, that I was carrying extra weight that I had never 
had an issue with in in the past. And, you know, I was a competitive gymnast. I was just, I'm pretty small framed. I just never had a weight issue. And then when I started, you know, working and had three kids at that point, I just like continued to gain weight and I could never lose this weight. And so suddenly I'm like 55 pounds overweight. I developed terrible adult acne over the course of, you know, the past few years leading up to this. And then also my energy levels were just like really low. And at first I thought, oh, it's because I'm traveling so much and I'm living on the airplane and I'm on all these different time zones. And then, you know, after a year of living, I didn't have a job. And I was just like, I, you know, what's the excuse? I saw a bunch of der dermatologists for my skin. They're like, we don't really know what's going on. And then I started looking at everything that I was eating because I, I started, you know, really thinking, okay, there has to be an issue and maybe I'm allergic to something. Maybe, you know, it's something there. And I went on a couple of different diets. Nothing was working. I was continuing to work out and work out a little bit more, but nothing crazy. I wasn't running like marathons or anything. While I was reading labels through this whole process, I never was doing anything with my drinks. And because I just never really thought that there was an issue with it because it, my, my core drink was diet soda, diet Coke in particular. And so one day the diet cocaine was just like facing me and I happened to look at the ingredients and I thought, gosh, there's a lot of ingredients in here. And I've sort of set up this rules for, you know, trying to eat as, you know, pure as possible in my food and really understand what I'm putting into my system. There's a lot of stuff in, in here and I'm drinking like eight to 12 of these a day, you know, which by the way, like that sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of people who are diet Coke addicts like I was that, that are doing that. And so I just thought, gosh, maybe I should just not put it or not put it in me anymore just for a couple of weeks like let me let me just stop drinking and see what happens and after a couple of days i realized like i wasn't drinking anything else when i was drinking diet coke mm -hmm. besides diet coke and i thought okay i'm going to start drinking water and um because i was thirsty and so i start drinking water and what i realized was it was so boring mm -hmm. like i was just like oh my god water's just incredibly boring and i would tell some of my friends and they're like, I know that's why I don't drink it. And then I tell other friends and they're like, oh, I drink water all the time. It's totally fine. I'm like, for me, like water is just super boring and that's why I'm not drinking it. So, you know, two and a half weeks later, I'm, I'm like literally lining up glasses of water on the counter and not going to bed at night until I like drink my eight glasses. And that's when two and a half weeks later, I lost 24 pounds. My skin cleared up. My energy levels had totally changed. And friends, when you lose 24 pounds in two and a half weeks, people really notice. They're like, whoa, like what just happened? <laughs> and I, and and I, are you okay? You know, are you sick? And I said, no, it was so crazy. And I would tell people the story about giving up my diet soda. And they, they were just like, <laughs> really? Like it's diet. And I said, I know, but I don't know, like somewhere along the way, it just messed up my a lot and I don't want to go back to it. I started like over the remainder of that year, I ended up losing the rest of my weight and got all 55 pounds off and was feeling great. My skin issues again had totally cleared. And then I started slicing up fruit and throwing it in the water because I thought like that'll help me drink water. People ask like, oh, did you ever put a little bit of juice in the water? And I was like, yeah, but like it tasted like watered down juice to me versus actually if I put fresh fruit in there. But the big problem that I saw with fresh fruit was like I would put it into a pitcher and I'd put it in the refrigerator and it would only last for like a day. And so I just thought, you know, I need to like it'd be so great if I could figure out how to put it into some sort of format and even like buy it ready made in stores. So then I went searching in stores for this product and it wasn't there. And then I thought, well, maybe it's not in San Francisco where I live, but maybe it's on the East Coast. So I had a trip back to New York, went looking around there and it wasn't there, too. And so I was looking for a job in tech. Like that's where my experience had been after working in media and, you know, Silicon Valley is like the hotbed of this. So I was interviewing, but I wasn't sort of finding exactly the thing that I thought was like really going to be the thing that I wanted to jump into. And so every single day I found myself like really thinking about this concept. Like if 
like how I had been tricked by the word diet and how some of my friends were drinking this drink called vitamin water and like were shocked when I told them that it had more calories than a can of Coke or, you know, that it's like the the food coloring is like cockroach wings, or at least that's what they were using 15 years ago to get to some of these different like very um, reddish colors. And so I, I just thought there's this hole in the market. I didn't even call it like a category opportunity. I wasn't even that educated about it, but I just thought, gosh, if I could actually get people to enjoy water, I could change health in the world. Mm -hmm. And I had never really been, you know, focused on a nonprofit either. Like I was kind of like, this is something that really gets me excited. And I thought, you know, if I could do something like this, that ultimately makes money, that would be awesome. That's as far as I had gotten. And so one day I'm in Whole Foods chatting with the guy that is putting stuff on the shelf. And he's, he's like, I said, I'm looking for a drink that just has fruit in it with water. And he said, you know, there's these drinks that are carbonated, but they have a lot of sodium in it. And I said, yeah, I don't really want to go switch from sweet to like sodium addiction. And so I just thought, how hard could it be to actually launch a product, right? And so I just thought, let me just do it. I didn't really think of it as a company. I really thought of it as, um, you know, can I get a product on the shelf? And that was it. And little did I know that it was, you know, I was not only starting a company, so, you know, I had figured out that there was this new category that and and why that's important is that when you launch a new category that consumers are not used to or buyers aren't used to sort of like wrapping their arms around or in our case, like actually buying for the mm -hmm. shelves of a store it's a huge deal. Like, it's like you, you can't, they, they won't move. Right. Because they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. So if you're launching cricket chips, right. Like it's like, might sound great to like some people, but you've got buyers and customers that just don't really understand it. And so there's a ton of education that goes on. So not only did I know that that existed, but also I had to figure out how do I ultimately get a shelf stable product? I, got it into Whole Foods, it ended up selling in Whole Foods. But then they were like, we can't have you just delivering in your Grand Cherokee to the stores. Otherwise, we would have thousands of yous like delivering. And so, you know, I got it. But at the end of the day, I didn't know how to get a distributor. The closest I had been to kind of figuring out how to distribute product was, or really what a distributor was, was seeing Coke and Pepsi trucks drive down the street. I didn't have experience in this. But what I often think about now, and again, I think it's easier to like look back and, and hindsight 2020 is that I had risen, you know, to pr a very high level at AOL. I was a vice president, was the youngest vice president at AOL, one of the few females. And, you know, I was in this management position where I really wasn't learning as much as I was teaching and approving. Mm -hmm. And so I always talk about today that I think half of the challenge with not only manager levels, but also C-suite executives is that you get bored, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're, and you're just not learning anymore. And so I think that this concept of, you know, what I was seeing as crazy as it might sound in the beverage industry, I was intrigued. And, and frankly, like I tell people about this, in, about what I do every single day who are, you know, major executives in companies. And they're like, I think it's so cool. Like what you're doing that you just like got to go back to to, you know, figuring out exactly how this stuff works. And I said, yeah, it's like this concept of lifelong learning that I've thought a lot about that I think everybody needs. We're human and, and we want to learn. And it doesn't mean yeah. going back to school. It means you just want to learn something new. I mean, you know, like, look, you had never done podcasting before you started doing podcasting and then you started and I'm sure you continue to learn right about little yep. concepts along the way. And me, too. And and that that's the thing that I really think is is really it's a story of tenacity and curiosity, but it's also a, a story of like, I loved what I was doing every day because I was learning something new. Yeah. And just so everybody understands, I think when you first thought of Hint and launched Hint, it was around uh, 97 or 98 when you first uh, uh, realized that diet soda was an issue, right? So at that time, 
everybody thought diet soda was healthy. Like I remember my dad was addicted to diet soda. Everybody thought that, um, you know, it was good for you and there was no side effects. And so, like you said, you had a lot up against you. It was really innovative to, you know, try to attack the beverage industry with a, a, a drink that wasn't sweet and f filled with sugar. Um, and so I, I give major kudos for you for basically like changing the landscape essentially. And one of the titles in your, in your book, one of the uh, chapter titles is actually, um, you know, build the, the airplane, you know, as you fly it. Right. So can you tell us more about building the airplane as you fly it? Because I think this really relates to everything that you're saying right now. Yeah, I think so often, um, you know, people don't ultimately go out and do things like start a beverage company or change careers because they feel like, you know, they don't have experience. They have plenty of doubts. There's a million reasons. And, you know, in my case, I had four kids under the age of six. Like, you know, there's like not only did I have my own doubts, but also I had all these doubters. So the title of my book is Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. I mean, there's... I've always said to people, like, there's never a good time, but that doesn't mean that you can't do something. And so I think that the concept of building mm -hmm. the airplane while you're flying it, obviously, you want it to be safe. In our case, you know, with our product, you know, we're giving it, we're selling it to consumers and they're drinking it. We don't want anybody to get sick or die. I mean, we were always really careful about that. But I think that something I learned in the mm -hmm. in the tech industry, which is still true today, which is very different than other industries, is that there's always going to be a better version, right? So often they call it upgrading or 2.1 or whatever, you know, they call it. And so it like I learned in the tech industry to actually get something mm -hmm. out the door because we want to not only get it out the door and try and get some revenue on it, but also go and learn from consumers. And so while an engineer is, you know, working on things that won't be ready for months because maybe the technology isn't quite figured out yet and it's going to take a certain amount of time, in addition, you might learn that people like the color red on a bottle versus blue or something and and how you know maybe the label is like the wrong feel or or something like that what i didn't realize that i was bringing into this new industry was that because i was asking lots of questions and because i had you know grown up in a world that was always like yeah, it's pretty good, but we could, you know, we can always do better. That's like a mindset, right? That's a mindset that you bring into an industry. When you look at banking or you even look at consumer products, I mean, look at, you know, Diet Coke or Coke overall, like you launch a product and, or they launch a product and then it sits there because it's selling. Right. And, and then they don't change it until sales go down. And mm -hmm. when they do decide to reformulate it, it's a really big deal. It's like, oh, they're, ch they're changing it because like it's about to die, right? Mm -hmm. Like instead of actually mm -hmm. saying, oh, this is the new version. I mean, you look at Apple, Apple's got, I'm sure there's an iPhone that's coming out in two years from now, right? That is just like sitting in mm -hmm. a back room that some engineers know about, right? Like it's just, it's in the tech industry. That's just how they think about things. And that's how they, and that's, that's just how ultimately products are made. And so I didn't realize that I was bringing that and asking lots of questions about the consumers and reading emails from consumers. But, you know, just by asking questions and not having experience in this industry, it just was super, super helpful. Yeah. So uh, one of my favorite stories when I was reading your book is the story about how you first got into Whole Foods. And uh, you actually talked to your husband and you gave him the news that you were pregnant with your fourth child and that you wanted to start a business called Hints at the same time. So I thought that it was really cool that first of all, you started this business with your husband and I just wanted to get, uh, you know, in your own words, what was it like when you, when you told him that news that you wanted to start this business? Like, was he, was he all ears? And then tell us about the story about the day of your scheduled C-section and uh, how you, you got into Whole Foods and the good news you had there. Yeah. 
so he had seen that I had, you know, really gotten healthier by drinking this concoction that I had made in my kitchen, water with fruit. And I would always like share with him like little things that I was thinking about, including the fact that there were all these like healthy perception products on the market. And, you know, it was kind of criminal that consumers actually wanted to get healthy and it was really hard. And they were willing to spend lots of money on diet plans and these healthier perception drinks, but they weren't actually doing the job. And like, that's as far as like I, he thought I had gotten. And then when I dropped the bomb on him that I like wrote this business plan and I wanted to take $50,000 out of our bank account. I mean, I didn't want him to think that I was going on some boondoggle with my girlfriends to the Bahamas or something with the $50,000. <laughs> I was like, by the way, just so you know, I took this money out because I want to buy like caps and bottles and fruit. And I'm going to be, I've got the this whole thing set up and he's like wait what like what what are you doing and I had three kids at the time under the age of four and he said wait you're you're actually like thinking about launching a product and actually but the name that I had come up with was Wawa and uh, he was from the East Coast and he said please don't call it Wawa and he's an attorney he said uh, he's an intellectual property attorney and he said uh, there's this you know major chain in Pennsylvania that's called Wawa and like don't call it Wawa and Plus, it's just not, mm -hmm. I know you call, you're trying to get the kids to drink water and you call it Wawa, but like you've been spending too much time with like the babies versus actually, you know, that's not, you shouldn't call it that. And so while I was talking to him about the name, I just started saying like, you know, we're giving people hints about how to get healthier and it's just a hint of this. And then I said hint and he said, it's a four letter word and you're never going to get it trademarked. And I was like, I was like pissed at this point. And so I said, just you be the lawyer, just file to have like this trademark done and I'm the business person and that's that. And so he said, okay, fine, whatever. And I was like, while you were at it, put in drink water, not sugar as well. And he was like, huh, too descriptive. You'll never get the trademarks. And, um, and so anyway, the moral of the story on that one is like, don't always listen to your husband or your, or your lawyer um, because we got the worldwide trademarks on, on both. It was at that point, you know, he didn't think it was a great idea. He was like, look, you're in tech, you're very marketable. We live in Silicon Valley. Like you can go get a job tomorrow if you really want to do that. And I said, yeah, but I'm waking up every single day and I'm thinking about this. And I, I love that it's that, you know, it's like a new category and it's really hard. And, and he was like, I, yeah, I just don't really think it's a great idea. You know, he wasn't arguing with me because I had made some money at AOL. He was like, you can do whatever you want. You know, he was being supportive, but I'm just sharing with you that I just don't think it's a great idea. And I was like, okay, well, by the way, I wish you were a little more supportive because I am pregnant with my fourth child. And he was like, you mean our fourth child? And I was like, of course, but you know, you're not being very supportive. And, you know, and he's like, I cannot believe you're pregnant. And I said, well, I just found out too, but I've just been trying to figure out a way to share this with you. And, and he was like, so you think this is a good idea? Launch a company in a category, in an industry that you know nothing about, and you're having another child. And I said, yeah, well, I can get it on the shelf, I think, before he's born. It should be sometime in May. This is 2005. And he is like, oh, my God, you're crazy. Like, you're seriously like nuts. And I said, yeah, maybe I might be. But I don't know. I just think it'd be really fun to go try. And so I said, by the way, I'm, I've got a babysitter and I'm leaving tomorrow to go to Chicago. I've got a I've got a bottling plant that I've been talking to. And he said, well, can I go with you? He was like, I kind of like to know what you're doing. And I think his intention was to sort of show me uh, like this is not a good idea. Like you have no idea what you're doing. And I was like, yeah, I'd be really great actually if you came because I'm getting super morning sick and it'd be awesome if you actually were there just in case he was like oh so you want me there just in case you get morning sick and I was like yeah it'd be really weird because I don't want to like tell them I'm like pregnant and I'm you know launching this company and anyway so he came and it was at that moment when he really saw he was like this is really cool like you know he's a he's a son of a doctor and he said you know you're this is crazy 
how you're thinking about this and in terms of, you know, helping it help you drink water and you could help a lot of other people drink water. And I agree with you that if you could get people to drink water, then I think you'd be, you know, solving a lot of health issues in the world. But I just don't think yeah. people get that. And I said, yeah. So for less than two bucks a bottle, if we could convert people into drinking, maybe they, they'll actually figure out that it's achievable and they'll start to look at what they're putting into their body. And so that was the purpose. Like then it still is the purpose yeah. today. Like when people say to me, you know, I drink tap water, like, is there anything wrong? And I mean, if you've got clean tap water, that's a whole other topic. But, but I said, no, not at all. Like our purpose has really been going after this diet soda industry and also the healthy perception products that are out there that should not be on the market, especially when we've got so many issues, not only, you know, with different diseases, including type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease, um, all kinds of things. But also, you know, the fact that we're even having a conversation around healthcare issues, like who pays, mm -hmm. right? It's expensive. And, you know, know, and when we it, something as simple as if we could actually dig into are there things that are causing these problems, you know, the, that and I believe diet soda and a lot of these sweeteners, it's not just sugar. It's also other stuff, too, that is just not great for you. So that was really, yeah. you know, the premise. And I just thought if we can just keep going and stay focused. And so I talk a lot about this in my book. And certainly this book is great for people who want to launch like a food or a beverage company and kind of go up against big guys. But I think it's also, you know, just to set the record straight around being a startup yeah. and being an entrepreneur that most of these people that I've met over, you know, the course of my journey, um, they don't actually know like they're no different than you and I, like they're, they're just trying to figure things out mm -hmm. and they're, you know, staying focused and they maybe came from a different industry and they didn't know whether or not they were going to be successful. And they had failures along the way. They were scared. Sometimes they made decisions that were wrong. Right. And, but they're able to look back on those things to learn and continue to move forward. And frankly, you know, I'm an, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. I'm also an accidental author. This was my journal for four years, like talking as I was out mm -hmm. speaking about building this company, I would bring this up on stage and I would hear from so many people, primarily through, you know, social media, like, gosh, I just heard you speak at this conference. And gosh, you just by saying what you said, you just set me straight and made me know that I'm not alone and that this is, this mm -hmm. isn't just happening to me. So I think it's it's definitely for people who are entrepreneurs now, would be entrepreneurs, college students who need to hear, like, how do you go out and like just get started? And so many, you know, lessons of lifelong learning along the way. And and it's it's shocking to me that more books like this aren't out there. And also very few female existing CEOs um, are writing, you know, books like this, too. Lots of guys, yeah. but there's just no women. Usually it's the it's like here's what happened mm -hmm. and how I lost my company not not like I'm still I'm still working it every single day mm -hmm. and still you know growing it and it's going great and I'm still you know willing to learn but you know I I figured out a lot of things there's still stuff that I need to figure out yeah, yeah. and I think that that's an important um, piece for people to hear yeah I totally agree and what I want people to understand is that when you first launched Tint that was like 15 years ago, you had a $50,000 investment, but you know, millions later, years later, so much hard work later, now you guys are a household name. And uh, one of my favorite quotes from your book was, sometimes if you think about the end, you'll never get past the beginning. And to me, that was like the most thing that resonated to me. So uh, I know we're up on time. So if you could close out just explaining to us, you know, how sometimes you need to just be in the moment, work as hard as you can, and then, you know, not worried so much about the outcome. No, totally. And not worry so much about the outcome and know that just by trying, you're getting started. And that's the most important piece. And those little tries add up. And before you know it, you're actually making progress. Yeah. So the last question I ask all my guests is what is your secret to profiting in life? Profiting in life, I would say being able to learn from your mistakes 
And same answer, continue trying along the way, because I think that the more that you actually look at what you're doing and continue moving forward, then you'll ultimately profit from that. And where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Kara Golden with an I all over social media. And also, yeah, I have a, I have a podcast as well um, at the Kara Golden Show. And my book is Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters on Audible as well as uh, on Amazon. Awesome. Well, Kara, you are one of the most inspirational women I've had on the show. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off.